Okay, so today is September 29th, 2020. As you all know, I like to start the beginning of the week off with a quote. And even though today is Tuesday, we obviously did not meet yesterday because it was a teacher work day. So this week, I've chosen a quote from Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is perhaps a, hopefully a woman who you have heard of before, as she is or she was a Supreme Court justice. She recently passed away. And her death has been in the news for a number of reasons, um, not the least of which is because she was only the second woman in the history of our country to sit on the Supreme Court and one of the few Jewish Supreme Court justices as well. Um, additionally, yesterday was the end of Yom Kippur, which is a Jewish holiday. So I chose this quote not only to recognize um, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's passing, but also her her religion and the ways that she was able to be a trailblazer for both women and Jewish people. And the quote is, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. So what this quote means to me is that we all have passions in life. We all have things that we care a great deal about. And we all want to defend those opinions and those beliefs and those values and ethics. But sometimes doing so can lead us to being defensive or offensive or problematic in some way. But if you can honestly say to yourself that you're fighting for the things that you believe in and the things that mean the most to you in a way that is going to allow you to recognize others' humanity, that is going to draw them in and inspire them, that's when you can say you're fighting for the good cause. Okay, so we, we want to be passionate about things. We want to have an opinion. But at the same time, we, we don't want to do, we don't want to behave or advocate in ways that will demean or belittle other people. We want to fight in ways that will cause others to be inspired by us. And that's what Ruth Bader Ginsburg did throughout her life. She was a champion of women's rights. Um, she sat on the Supreme Court, which hopefully you all know is the highest court in the land which means that they do not really they don't they don't really discuss you know basic criminal charges or civic civil uh, cases, but they they discuss cases that have already been decided by lower courts, and the Supreme Court decides if those if those cases were decided correctly. And so these are some of the most controversial and some of the most complicated arguments um, in the history of our country. And only nine people at a time sit on the Supreme Court, but they can sit on Supreme Court for their entire life. So um, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a Supreme Court justice starting in the 90s. She was appointed by Bill Clinton. And um, she, she sat on the Supreme Court until her passing a couple of weeks ago. So it's a lifelong appointment. It's a huge deal. And um, we should certainly be proud of all that Ruth Bader Ginsburg contributed to our country. All right, so go ahead and take your notes out. Hopefully you already have them out. But the title of today's lesson is Cell Membrane and Homeostasis. Again, this is unit four, day three. So hopefully you are taking good organized notes. Good organized notes definitely should highlight the title of the lesson and when the lesson was taught. The objective for today's lesson is that biologists will be able to explain how the plasma membrane maintains homeostasis. And the essential question that we will seek to answer asks, how does the membrane allow certain substances in and others out to maintain homeostasis? All right, let's go ahead and jump into it. Hopefully you have your notes out at this point. So again, the highlighted phrases and sentences are what you should hope to write down. So here's the definition of homeostasis. We talked about it way back in unit zero when we introduced the concept of Sternger, but here it is again. Homeostasis means maintaining a constant and stable internal balance maintaining a constant and stable internal balance. So 
So we've got all these different different things going on in our bodies and they need to exist in a relatively constant and balanced range. Stepping outside of that balance ultimately can be dangerous to our bodies and sometimes even fatal. But it's not just humans that need to do homeostasis, it's all living organisms. So again, sometimes we have a tendency to see and talk about things from the humanistic perspective, but we have to realize that all living things need to be able to maintain an internal balance. All living organisms regulate bodily functions and substances, such as pH, water, glucose, temperature, and many, many others. The good thing about this is that it happens involuntarily. So mammals have these large brains that allow us to process huge amounts of sensory information. Somebody have a question? Sorry, I thought I heard somebody ready to ask a question. But the good thing about all of these things that our bodies are doing for us is that they we don't have to actively think about it. Throughout the day, I don't, I don't have to actively tell my body to breathe. I don't have to actively tell my body to maintain its temperature or to maintain its sugar levels. All of these things my brain is still responsible for, but I don't have to actively think about it. So this is what we mean when, it, when we say that this happens involuntarily. I don't have to voluntarily do these things. My body will do them for me. So remember, you should be writing down the sentences and phrases that are highlighted. You don't need to write them in both languages, just whatever your preferred language is. So down there at the bottom of your screen, you've got a definition for pH. You don't need to write that down. But pH is a measure of how much hydrogen is in a substance. That's why we have the capital H. It represents hydrogen. And depending on how much hydrogen there is in the substance, we know how, how acidic that substance will be. So the more hydrogen, the more acidic the substance is. Lemon juice is very, very acidic. It's got a pH of two, which means that it's got a high concentration of hydrogen. On the other end of the spectrum, we've got bleach, which is very basic or very alkaline. It has a pH of 12, and that's because it has a, high, a low concentration of hydrogen. So the more acidic something is, the more hydrogen it has. The less acidic, the less hydrogen it has. Our cells constantly work to regulate our bodies. pH is just one of the things that our bodies must regulate. But our cells, this is what you should write down, our cells are constantly working to regulate all of those things that we've talked about, sugar, oxygen, carbon dioxide, pH, temperature, whatever else you can think of, electrolytes. And the way that our cells are able to regulate all of those different substances is by use of the cell membrane. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. But we can see that within our bodies, within humans' bodies, there's a very small range at which we can still be healthy. 
So here's an example of what I mean by that, specifically as it relates to pH. So our bodies can really only exist healthily between a pH of 7.35 and a pH of 7.45. So that's a really, really small normal range. Outside of that range, you start to get sick. You could experience acidosis if, it become, if your body becomes too acidic, or you can experience alkalosis if your body becomes too basic. And then even small variations can lead to fatal conditions. All right, so our body has a hugely important responsibility of maintaining this normal range of pH. And if you go to your doctor and you get blood work done, they can actually look and see, you know, what your pH level is. And they may make some recommendations about how you can monitor your pH and maintain a, a more normal pH um, if you're outside of the range. So sometimes people need to drink what's called alkaline water. So if your blood is, if your blood is too acidic and you're over here, Sometimes drinking alkaline water can push you back into the normal range. That's just for those of you who may be interested in anatomy or the human body or medicine. All right. But as I said, the cell membrane is ultimately what is responsible for homeostasis. The bullet point that you should write down says homeostasis occurs at a cellular level where the cell membrane regulates what enters and exits. <clears throat> Homeostasis occurs at a cellular level where the cell membrane regulates what enters and exits. So the cell decides what can come in and what can go out. All right. The properties of cell membranes that allow them to do this are important to note. So again, you should be writing down the words that you see that are highlighted. If you wanna write down these other words that come after the colon, you're more than welcome to do that. And I think you should if you have time, but we really definitely need to make sure that we're writing down the highlighted words here. So the cell membrane is what is called a phospholipid bilayer meaning it is made of two layers of lipids, and those two layers face each other. We'll see that in a couple of slides. Of course, the prefix bi, B-I, means two. So we've got a phospholipid bilayer made up of two layers of lipids. The cell membrane is also flexible and fluid it can flow and move with its surroundings. All right, now this is important because of course the cell itself often needs to be able to move, but it's also important because you don't want a rigid cell. We're not, animal cells don't need to be rigid. We need them to be fluid. The cell membrane is also what is called a mosaic a mosaic. And this means that it has many substances embedded inside of it. Many diverse substances, different sizes, different shapes, different functions, different abilities, different colors. This is where we get, or why we describe the cell membrane as a mosaic. It's really, really diverse in its composition. And lastly, the cell membrane is selectively permeable. Selectively permeable, which means that it only lets certain things in and out.
So it's picky, it's choosy, it selects what comes in and what goes out. Not everything can come in, not everything can go out. And this is obviously important. You don't want intruders, but you also don't want to lose the things that are inside of the cell that the cell needs. It would be bad if all the mitochondria of the cell just you know, left this through the cell membrane. It would be bad if all of the different waste and debris from outside of the cell was able to just easily get in. So we need this selectively permeable membrane to choose what can come in and what can go out. Okay. Additionally, the cell membrane has two special properties. Two, two regions of the cell membrane have special and different properties. One region of the cell membrane is hydrophobic. The prefix hydro, of course, means water. The suffix phobic means fear of. So remember, if we can remember the roots of these words, our scientific vocabulary will continue to improve because we can just take the roots that we do know, put them together to figure out the definition of the word. So hydro is water, phobic is fear of. So hydrophobic means fear of water. These are nonpolar substances that do not like water. And on the other hand, philic means love for. So hydro is water, hydrophilic means love for water. So hydrophilic substances are polar and they do like water. Hydrophobic does not like water. Hydrophilic does like water. So please make sure you're writing down the definition, definitions of hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Okay. So here's an example or a, a depiction of what we were just talking about. So the phospholipid bilayer, of course, bi means two. So a bilayer, a phospholipid bilayer is made up of two layers of lipids. We've got these balls, these red balls here, which are the hydrophilic heads. Philic means the love of. So we've got these heads that are hydrophilic, meaning they love water. And here we've got these hydrophobic tails, phobic meaning fear of. So these tails do not like water. So what we have is on both sides of the membrane, in the extracellular space and in the intracellular space, we've got water and the heads like water. So they're fine being exposed to this water. But the hydrophobic tails are not fans of water. They don't like water. So what they do is they face towards each other. They insulate each other so that they don't actually have to interact with water at all.
to really understand this, I want you all to draw this in your notes. So in some space that you have in your notes, I want you to draw this image that you see on your left screen, on the left side of your screen. We've got the extracellular space, <clears throat> we've got the intracellular space. Extra means outside, so outside of the cell. Intra, of course, means inside, so inside of the cell. I want you to draw five circles in your notes to represent the hydrophilic heads, the heads that like water. Draw five circles to represent that. I also want you to draw five pairs of curved lines to represent the hydrophobic tails. So your curved lines should just come right out of your hydrophil hydrophilic heads. We should also note that the hydrophobic tails face one another and they are very, very close to one another as well. This ensures that water cannot get in. Remember, the hydrophobic tails do not like water. And I tried to depict that with this kind of like gray background. They don't like water though. So they pack themselves very tightly together so that water cannot get in. So draw your little, draw this little, I'm sorry. Draw this little section of a membrane and over the next 30 seconds. It does not need to be your masterpiece. We just want to make sure that you have this in your notes. Okay. Make sure that you've labeled it too. So you know where the heads are, you know where the tails are. The whole thing is considered the phospholipid bilayer. Nothing for you to write down on this slide. I just wanted you to see this image, this animation of what's happening. You can see how fluid the membrane is. It's still able to move. But you can also see how tightly packed those phospholipids are. So we've got the, the balls, the blue balls that represent the hydrophilic heads. And then we've got those light blue strings hanging down, which represent the hydrophobic tails. There's some movement that is allowed, as you can see, some of the hydro, sorry, some of the possible question. Do we gotta write that down? No, nothing for you to write down here. All right. So we can, we can just see how it's kind of bouncing up and down. It's moving with its surroundings. I'm gonna skip that. You should write this down, you should write the definition of a protein channel and the definition of a carbohydrate chain. So your protein channel is a large protein that crosses through the membrane. Most of them cross through the membrane and they allow things to move through the membrane that otherwise could not get through on their own. So there are some things that just don't fit through the membrane or they don't interact well with the hydrophobic tails. So they need the help of these proteins that serve as tunnels to get through the membrane from the outside of the cell to the inside or vice versa. So those protein channels help move large molecules through the membrane that cannot move on their own. The carbohydrate chain, on the other hand, 
helps to stabilize and identify cells. So the carbs that are inside of the membrane are there because we don't want the cell to move too much. We don't want the cell membrane to be too fluid. It needs to have some structure to it. But we also don't want it to be too rigid. So we have carbohy carbohydrates there in order to stabilize it. It allows for just the right amount of movement. We can also see what I was talking about earlier, that the, the membrane is a mosaic because it has all these different things embedded inside of it. We've got several different types of proteins. Some of the proteins go all the way through. Some of them are just embedded on one side. We've got these, carb these uh, cholesterols that are also embedded on the ends in the inside of the membrane. We've got these carbohydrates that are like antenna that can help with signaling and stabilizing the cell. So there's just a lot going on in this membrane and that's why we call it a mosaic. It's got all these different things inside of it that have diverse functions, diverse shapes, diverse sizes, and diverse jobs. All right, so uh, concentration is important to understand in this lesson but it can sometimes be a difficult concept for students to get. So I'm gonna walk you through exactly what concentration is. Please do write down this definition of concentration. It says concentration is a measure of how much of something there is in a given volume. Concentration is a measure of how much of something there is in a given volume. Okay, so this is the same definition from the last slide. So if you've already written it down, no need to write it again. And you don't need to write this down. I just wanna give you an idea. So we measure concentration typically in mass, in units of mass over volume, mass divided by volume. So for example, we could have grams over milliliters. So grams is a measure of mass, how, how much, um, how much of something there is, and then milliliters is a measure of volume, how much space of something there is. So grams per milliliter, or we could do grams over cubic centimeters, grams per cubic centimeters, moles per liter, this is one that you'll explore in chemistry, moles per liter, or pounds per gallon. These are all measure concentration. So these containers, these two containers have the exact same volume. I just copied and pasted. But we can tell that they have different concentrations of the things inside. So which of these containers has the greater concentration of the yellow circles? Which one has the greater concentration of yellow circles?
Which of those containers has the greater concentration of yellow circles? Which one has more of the yellow circles? Thank you, Jessica. The container on the right has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven yellow circles, whereas the container on the left only has three. So what this means is that because they have the same volume, this container over here has a greater concentration of the yellow circles. Let's try another one. What about the purple diamonds? Which container has the greater concentration of purple diamonds? Thank you, Jessica, yet again. The container on the left, the container on the left has six purple diamonds versus the container on the right, which only has four. So the container on the left has a greater concentration. Lastly, what about these smiley faces? Which container has the greater concentration of those blue smiley faces? Or turquoise? Thank you yet again, Jessica. They have the same number, okay? So this is important because this is a concept called equilibrium. And this is what we'll explain in a couple of slides. but cells want to have an equal concentration on their inside as they do on the outside in most cases. That's called equilibrium. We'll see what that looks like in a couple of slides. Oftentimes, cells do not have the same concentration on the inside as there is on the outside. And this leads to what is called a concentration gradient. It's a difference in concentration between one solution and another. So you should write that down. A concentration gradient is a difference in concentration between one solution and another, such that one is more concentrated than the other. In this image, we can see what this looks like. Here we've got the lipid bilayer. So this is your cell membrane right here. On the top is the extracellular space. So this is outside of the cell. And then on the bottom, we've got intracellular space. So this would be inside of the cell. So what we can notice, what we should notice is that to begin with, the concentration on the outside of the cell is way higher than it is on the inside. I've got, I think probably, I think this is 28 of these blue molecules to start off with on the outside of the cell and zero on the inside. So this is far more concentrated. Then as time goes on, we should start to see that this concentration gradient is still there, but some of the molecules are moving on the inside of the cell. They're moving through the membrane to the inside of the cell. So the concentration gradient is still there because this extracellular space is still more concentrated and the intracellular space is less concentrated, but it's starting to correct itself. And when I say correct itself, what I mean is it's starting to approach equilibrium. The goal of a cell, and I'm reading from this first bullet point here, you should write this down. <clears throat> the goal of a cell is to be in equilibrium. This is when the concentration of molecules is equal on both sides, on the inside and the outside of the cell. That's the goal of all cells, to achieve equilibrium, usually. 
So on the left, again, we're starting off not in equilibrium. There's a concentration gradient. It's more concentrated on the outside, and it's more diluted on the inside, meaning less concentrated. Then, then as time goes on, some of the substance flows through the cell membrane inside of the cell. And then eventually, we will reach equilibrium, where now you've got the same concentration on the outside as you do on the inside. So equilibrium is when the concentration of molecules is equal on both sides, on the inside and the outside of the cell. All right. <clears throat> so as we saw here, we can see that some of these substances are moving through the membrane. And whatever this molecule is, it doesn't need any help to get through the membrane. It just moves through right by itself. No help needed. So molecules that can cross the membrane without help are typically small molecules. They are nonpolar molecules. They are uncharged molecules, meaning they're neutral. They don't have a charge. Some examples of this would be oxygen gas, which is O2, nitrogen gas, which is N2, carbon dioxide, which is CO2, or methane, which is CH4. These are all small molecules that are nonpolar and they are neutral, they don't have a charge. So these, these guys can move through the cell membrane without any help. They don't need to rely on some sort of channel to get through the membrane. On the other hand, larger molecules, polar molecules, and charged molecules, meaning they have a positive or a negative charge, they need help getting through the membrane. They can't just go through by themselves. They need some sort of protein channel, like the one you're seeing on the right, to allow them to move through the membrane. Because they're either too large or they're too polar. So some examples of this would be H2O, which is water. Remember, the inside of the membrane is hydrophobic. It doesn't like water. So water can't just go through by itself. It needs the help of a channel to get through the cell. NaCl, which is sodium chloride, this is your basic table salt. It's not big, but it is polar. So it doesn't fit well through the membrane. And then glucose, which is a bigger molecule and also has some polarity. So it doesn't fit well through the membrane. So these substances would need the help of some protein to fit through the membrane. You should write down this table. So I'm gonna give you about 60 seconds to make sure you've written down this table. Hey, I came in a little late. You uh marked me as in class. Is that Brandon? Okay. Yeah.
All right. <clears throat> so we've got about 25 minutes left and your assignment is to complete the exit ticket. And then there's also an assignment um, called the Interactive Cell Membrane Work and Questions. And it's going to take you to this interactive uh, simulation of the cell membrane. It's got very explicit and, and uh, direct instructions. So you'll walk through this activity and at the same time, you'll be able to answer the questions that are on the Canvas quiz for the day. All right, so you should probably have both open at the same time. If you open up the assignment on Canvas, the link to get to this interactive simulation is there. We've got about 25 minutes left in class, so that should be plenty of time to do that assignment as well as the exit ticket. And if you need me to go back to any slides to get some of the notes that you may have missed, please just let me know.
Okay, folks, it's 120, so you are good to go. Please let me know if you will need any assistance between now and tomorrow. Uh, hopefully, that.